We'll get the guys back in. If the sound is still awful, we'll call it a day. We'll call it a day. But yeah. so we'll try that. Although now it's bloody working. <laughs> I can't hear any squealing. Yeah, now it's gone. Yeah, it's fine now. So we just turn it off, man. Yeah, go. Go. What we'll okay, right, right. We're going to start at six six twenty three. Welcome to the weekly live hangout. <laughs> ignore what. You, ignore the previous twenty minutes. Ignore all the previous lies. Ignore it. I've not got <laughs> three thousand items. I've I've got thirty three items. <laughs> I, I sell two above. No, we're, um, we we like I mean, didn't you have any questions as well? For, like that people had asked for for Ken as well, actually. I, I just had some um, that I'd come up with just to keep okay. the conversation going. But yeah. we were going to see if anybody posted any questions yeah. um, as we went. They're probably yeah. just all saying, "This is appalling. I can't hear what you're saying." Yeah, this is terrible. No, I mean, we, what what we were chatting about. How to alienate your audience? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what we were chatting about before is that the kind of Again, I mean, there's 47 people actually watching this somehow. Um, well so, done, guys. And, and, and Skynet <laughs> says it's um, it's that well, good use. Good says it sounds great now. Yeah. So um, yeah, sorry for that. Right. It's football's on at eight o'clock. Clock's ticking, guys. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's only, yeah. It's only Germany, France. Only Germany, France. Yeah. I mean, what w things are working now. So. Um, we're going to just carry on. What we were talking about was how you do need passion to do the kind of store that you're doing. And I asked a bit of a leading question about, like, you know, would you recommend, like, I, I tried to emulate the store <laughs> style that Ken has got. And, you know, the answer was, obviously, no, because you need to have an interest in this. And, and then Ken was talking about, um, you know, how, how long it took him to find his his niche or what he was comfortable with. So, yeah, well, it took me from 2011 yeah. to 2014 on and off, you know, because uh, I didn't stick in it from 2011 to 2014. I, I tried something, it didn't work. I gave up for a few months. Started again doing something else, gave up for a few months. Uh, and like I say, it was only August 2014 that I really, really started. And it, was, it was because of Nick's videos, because... Him and Scavenger Life, I'd say, because I was thinking to myself, I need to get this going, and then I started watching a few videos, and that's what inspired me to do it. But it's all right being inspired. You've got to actually then put the effort in and keep that effort up. You know, that's the hard part, is is that relentless listing month after month after month. You know, but the last, the last three or four months, I've really, really upped it this year. Uh, like I say, I'm up to three, just short of 3,500 items now, and it has made a big difference. I mean, if anyone does watch my sales videos and they've been watching them for the, sort of like the past 12 months, they'll see that I'm virtually double doing double what I was doing 12 months ago. Sometimes treble some weeks, and it's not luck, and it's not the fact that you know I've got better feedback or anything like that. It's just the fact that I've got more numbers on and. Obviously, the quality of stocks increasing because I've got better purchasing power now. You know, that's that's the main difference. So, so is the plan still the same then, Ken? That you're going to keep building? Because my yeah. question would be, are you struggling for space, and can you see a limit to your inventory? Well, I thought the limit was going to be five thousand items, but I've probably got more than that anyway now if I count all my unlisted uh, postcards and photographs. But the postcards and photographs, I don't really want to keep up in a massive sort of like I don't want eighty percent of my stores to be postcards and photographs because I'm getting to that stage now where I'm taking a reasonable amount of money. I'm trying to buy things that will give a reasonable return, so that's why my sales have gone up because the percentage of the lower value items is slowly dropping. Uh, the percentage of the better value items is increasing. Like this week, I've sold an item for 110, I've sold one for 130, I've sold one for 150, and I've sold one for 85. I've probably got maybe five or 600 items over £50 in my store. So even on a quiet time, I only have to hit three or four of those and be taken to two. You know, I only have to hit four £50 items that week, and that's £200 to start you off. You know, um, so that's what, what I'm able to. What sort of stock investment are you putting in monthly, or do you not have a sort of do you, do you have a sort of an amount of money you put into stock monthly, or is it as just much as, pos as much as possible? Right. I don't really have a set figure. Um, it's basically 
it's like a gambler, you know, like you have a gambler who plays poker and he has his poker money and that's it, you know, he, he'll live on the basics and, you know, he'll, every, that, he's got to have that money for his gambling, well, I've got to have that money for my stock and it's the same sort of thing, you know, I've not got a nice car, I've got an old car, but it does, it does, it's reliable, it's a good vehicle, um, it carries what I need to carry, so I don't think to myself, oh, I'll spend 5,000 quid on a van or something. I want a van in the future, but I'll wait. Uh, mm. My son, my son gives me a lot of advice. He's really good on economics and, and business management and stuff like that. And he said that you've just got to keep plowing it all back in as much as you can for for what I want to do. And uh, you keep plowing it back in. I mean, I'm, I'm on sixty two thousand pounds worth of stock listed now, and I think the last time I spoke to you, I was on forty. Yeah. It wasn't that long ago, so. I've increased it by 50% in that time, the amount of stock that I've got listed. So consequently, your sales increase, which means you can buy more stuff, uh, you can buy better items, so your stock level goes up and up and up. But I think my, my sort of like natural figure is going to be now, I did I was thinking 5,000 items, but I'm probably thinking 10,000 items now I, I'll be happy with. Sorry, I was just... That's, that's, a sort of, that's, what, I'm, that's what I'm aiming for, is 10,000. But then... Hopefully, I'm going to bring my son into the into the business then, uh, because he's very very good with computers. Uh, he built my PC for me. Uh, he's he's a really clever lad, and uh, you know his his head switched on with business and finance and stuff like that. And uh, you know that's that's the aim. If I can get up to ten thousand items, get a really decent amount of money coming in each month, I can incorporate him in. Not on much of a wage to start off with, but bring him in and then. Hopefully, he'll be like a director of the company eventually. That's what I'm aiming for because there doesn't seem to be much future out there in terms of decent jobs these days. Not without having to sort of like sell your soul to the man. So uh, that's the way that that, that uh, I think it's going to go. He's going to finish his degree. He's having a year off. He's he's, he's split his university. He's having a year's break. Uh, then he's going back. And once he's done his degree, I think he'll be coming in then. Which will buy that car back on his road. If if he's got the sort of business acumen and the computer skills, he could almost run that technical side of it, and you'll be sourcing stock. Is that how you envisage well, that, it? That your yeah, job yeah. Will be? I mean, he comes up occasionally and he helps me now, and like, I, I, he's he's very good. Like, I, I just I just said to him, like, we built a little in, in the attic. Now we've cleared. He cleared the whole attic out. It was just full of junk and piles of stock that weren't organised. He's built all racking all the way around the outside. So we've got a racking area upstairs in the loft now. So we've got lots of, well, when I say the loft, it's a proper attic with a staircase and that. Uh, and we've got a photography area. And he, he came down a couple of weeks ago and I just said to him, look, you know, uh, I need all these items photographing. Take a, picture of the, take a picture of the item from a distance, then the front, back, all the sides. I just left him to it with a camera he's never used and lights he wasn't, you know. And he, he just did it and he come back down and there was 500 photos done. So while he was doing those, I was listing other items. So it, it just speed the process up. When there's two of you, it's... I reckon we could we could list three hundred items in a week between us. Quite, and that's not exaggerating. Doing it as a proper full time job, <clears throat> we could quite easily do that. Yeah, yeah, you know. And also, the way I buy is is has changed. Like I bought this diecast yesterday. There was seven lots of diecast there, all with like twenty items a lot, and I bought six of the seven lots. So I've got like eight crates of uh, model trucks behind me that are going to be listed. But I tend to sort of like, I'll list them all, I'll photograph them all together. I've already done the research, it's all written out, and I'll list them all together. So I speed my listing process up. And then when I've gone off trucks, I'll go on to tins. When I finish my tins, the silver will have built up a bit, so I'll start listing the silver. And I just go through it like that. So I'm trying to get that process down to sort of like a fine art, not so where I'm listing a, a, a helmet, and then I'm listing a gas mask, then I'll think, oh, I've got a, a sign off a railway engine, I'll list that next. I'm doing all the similar sort of things together. So, like, when I get 10 signs, I'll do a, 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 an hour of listing signs. Yeah, I've you know, tried so to I'm not messing it about. It yeah. Because I'm trying to, trying to you, sort of you can build a template and reuse the template, and a lot of the information stays the same, doesn't it? And then you just well, change the key it, details. Because I've got like say maybe like say 15, 20 niches, niches, niches I should say that I uh, I sell in. Um, 
I just go into my sold listings. So, like, if I get a hip flask, I think, oh, I sold one of them three weeks ago. Just go into my solds, pick the hip flask out, press sell similar, and just change a couple of things and put the photo in. So it's yeah. so quick because everything's there already waiting. Because I, I know that I always sell hip flasks. I always sell things to do with playing cards. So somewhere badges again. I sell a lot of badges. So I'll know that it doesn't have to be the exact same badge. I just need to pick out another military badge. I know it'll be in the right category. Uh, most of the most of the details will be there, and I can just change a few little bits. All basically, I've got to change is the condition and, and a couple of things in the item description, you know, and, uh, and the item specifics, and that's it. So the listing has got a lot quicker now, you know, a hell of a lot quicker. I I do that a fair bit with really common items. I picked up a job lot of ink last week, and I was going to send it to Amazon. Decided against that, put it on eBay. I just searched the actual cartridge, found someone else that did it, clicked sell similar, and basically cut and pasted their listing. For an item that is as common as, common as ink, you know, I got a Google image of it, I didn't even take a picture, and then dropped that in, and it, it takes about a minute max to, to write a listing that way. So yeah. I do that a fair bit, for common stuff anyway. Well, I was going to say... That. Sorry, go on. Go on. I was going to say, when you said you, you bought all that die cast stuff, how much research are you doing? Let's say there was a tray with 20 die casts in it. Would you bother researching it, or have you got a figure in your head that they're worth each, roughly? Yeah, that's the way I did. What I did was I, I knew that some of them would be £10 items. I knew that most of them would be between 15 and £30 items. So I just thought to myself, right, there's 15 in a box... I will pay 75 quid, which is £5 an item, plus commission, so it would be £6 an item would be my maximum. So I knew I wasn't going to go above 70 for any of the lots, but luckily, every lot I got for between 40 and 45 because it was, I was only bidding against somebody who'd left a commission bid, and he must have, like, bowed out at either 38 or 43, <laughs> you know, so... There was nobody in the room was competing against me. But if if there were people in the room competing against me, I would just leave it. I wouldn't. Once it gets to that seventy, you know, I'm out basically. So I was, I was, I was just. I thought I was only going to get one or two lots. But I, like I say, I got six out of the seven. The only lot I didn't get was there was a collector who wanted two specific models out of a lot, and he and he went up a little bit too high. Uh, but every, all the other lots I got, and they're all sort of like. The, they're not brand new, but they're, they're as new. They're, they've never been out of the box, these items. They're all sort of like collectors' lorries and stuff, you know. Uh, and there's loads of them. There's crates and crates of them. But the thing is, is I could get, I'd probably I'd get them listed a day and a half. And I spent, yeah. I spent 453 quid at the auction yesterday. Uh, and I've priced it all out, and it comes out at 1939. So to me, that's not a bad markup. You know, even after fees, I'm gonna get double back. You know, like I say, I've invested like, invested 400. I'm probably I'm gonna more than net 1200 back after fees, postage, all the costs. Um, so you know, it's like turning 400 into 12, 1400 quid net. You know, yeah, absolutely. So that's so, the way I work. That's actually Lucky quite you. interesting in um in a different way as well because um. Like you, you're talking about the amount of stock you're picking up there, Ken. Like you know, crates and crates of lots, and the amount that you're listing. Um, I mean, I think it would be interesting, especially for like resellers that are trying to get into this now, to to kind of get an idea that how do you keep your motivation up? Because we know that sometimes, you know, in our chat, it, even when you're used to having regular good sales, you sometimes have the odd blip. And, and it can still yeah. shake you. Could you just like talk it about does, that? For it a shakes me every time. It shakes me every time. You know, um, I had a brilliant June. I did just short of four thousand before any fees and postage costs were taken off. And if you compare, I think I did three thousand nine hundred and sixty-two. And Christmas month in 2015, I did 4,060. So basically, I virtually matched my sales figure from December in the worst month of the year, June. So I had a brilliant June, and then July, the, fir the fir first day in July, I think I sold two items. The second of July, I sold like one item. And it was like, I thought, God, my average, average daily figure's gone from like 140, 150 pounds a day down to like 30, 40 pounds a day. 
But then Tuesday I did 400 quid in one day, and Wednesday I did 300 quid. Now today I've done two items so far. So, you know, but those day, those quiet days, I start thinking, hang on a minute, what's going wrong here? You know, even I, you know, even <laughs> after years of doing it, I, I panic every time. That's such an important thing to put out there because I think, I mean, we've we've had comments where I think sometimes it, it we can give off the impression that it it's just it's quite simple the, the whole process or reselling simple. I mean, it's simple in the in the sense that there's a very low barrier to entry. All you need is a quid to buy an item and then flip it for a profit. But that's yeah. really not doing it service, is it, guys? I mean, that I think it's important to kind of to talk that even when you're at the stage where you've got 3,000 items in your inventory, you're confident, you're doing well, it, it can still put the heebie-jeebies up you if you have an odd day. Um, and another thing actually that's quite interesting is you said you spent like 400 quid at the auction and you bought like crates of cars and you've got how many out items out of that roughly? Oh, uh, if you were to just... 75. I put, with, with a bit of silver and the medals that I bought, I've probably bought a hundred items, maybe. See, there you go. And uh, if you'd like to kind of just compare that to what I've done, I've been at the auction again this week, and I spent about four hundred quid, and I've got three items. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just a different way of doing it, it's isn't like it? Doing the same thing, and and again, profit-wise, I'll be looking at what you're talking about. So, yeah. spent four hundred. The sales should add up to around a grand minus the fees. So, not quite as much as yours, but obviously, I'm going for a different approach. And yeah, but I think it's with Dapsa here on mine. Like I say, I've worked the price out of everything at 1940. I've not overpriced anything either. With the die cast, I'm trying to be competitive. Yeah. I'm not going on my usual thing like with the antiques where I price them high. Yeah. Um, because I've got a decent margin, I've not paid a lot for them. But uh, that 1940 might come back over five years. Do you know what I mean? When you're selling three yeah. items, you might sell them the next three months. You know, yeah. so... It's I like you said, it's I different. Some of them will go straight away, but others won't. You know, mm. it's just a case of like I bought these Masonic badges. I've got, I've already got Masonic badges, but I start thinking to myself, well, I'll just top. Them. It's like, like Scavenger Life say, it's just like put, building these pipelines and just feeding the stock in at one end, and it's trickling out at the other. You know, and that's that's all I'm doing really. Yeah, I think it was just nice to illustrate the the fact that we're pretty much doing the same thing, but in such a different way. Um, yeah. Even using the same method, so it's kind of you know good to to, to put that out. Oh there. yeah, because you you can go to the auctions and buy three individual items and, and make a lot of money, you know. Yeah, I mean the only thing again, I would say is associated with each, isn't there? Yeah, well there is because with a job lot, I think generally speaking, with a job lot, the risks are lower. Yeah, because. There's, if you buy some, a job lot with 30 or 40 items and you're paying, even if you paid 100 quid, you paid £2 an item. Yeah, exactly. You've not, it's, you've not got to find many decent things in there before you start thinking, well, I've broke even and I'm into profit. I mean, you, you can buy you one item. Know I was, um, yeah. yeah, you guys know I was worried that when I bought a certain item, I was like, oh, I hope it works. And I got it home and thankfully yeah. it works. So I'm sitting pretty now, but I could have easily been sitting here thinking. I think we've got that screaming sound again. Let me move again. Are we getting yeah. any comments about the quality again? Because Yeah, people are saying the budgie's back. I mean, um, I wasn't saying anything for ages then, but I could hear it. Move back inside, how's that? Uh, it's still there. I think it might go eventually. Like, There you go, it's gone. I think it's gone. Uh. <laughs> um, you've had a couple of questions actually directed at you. Um, Ian Wedderburn asks you, Ken, um, do you list good till cancelled or are your items relisted? Uh, I'm on seven day listings. I use a seven day sell similar sort of thing. So nothing, nothing in my store. The only good till cancelled items I have got is I've got uh, a few badges and a few postcards where I've got multiples. So obviously, with the multiples, they're on good till cancelled. But the thing is, with that is, I have noticed. I mean, I think I've got 92, 92 items on good till cancelled, and the sales are virtually non-existent until one of them sells. And then suddenly, like I had a, a, eight badges that were all exactly the same. One sold, and then they all started selling within weeks. So um, yeah, the rest of my stuff is all on seven-day listings. Which sounds like a lot of work, uh, but as long as eBay hasn't got any glitches, it's not too bad. 
uh, because you can bulk relist 200 items at a time. Well, I think you yeah. can do 500, but on the cell similar that I do, I think it's 200. So even if you do like like tonight, I have two and a half thousand items listed, probably about now actually. Um, as long as there's not no bugs with eBay, I should be able to relist those in about twenty minutes. Not bad. Um, Gary no. Dunster also asks, why don't you just do a multi listing for the postcards? You can't do that. No, it's because it, it's not it's not like selling a, a new item. I mean, I could do a multi listing, but I'd rather I, I've got an anchor shop, so I'd rather just have individual listings for everything. Because um, with a multi listing, people have actually got to go into that list and start selecting items, uh, and it's not as clear cut as like seeing an item. Yeah, that's what I'm buying. But if you put say uh, 500 postcards for sale, please choose your card. That will put a <laughs> lot. Of, I think that will put a lot of customers off. It would. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Plus, you wouldn't be able to look through lists. You wouldn't be able to go into the detail and show all the de all the pictures of each individual item and no, go into the no. level of detail. So, I, to me, I have a fixed monthly expense with my store, which is two hundred and it's two hundred and seventeen pound a month. But I can list as much as I want. If I want to run three day listings, I can run three day listings. If I want to relist every three days. Um, no extra cost, and I can put items into two categories at no extra cost, which no, no other level of store you can do that, and that makes a massive difference. Um, a lot of items I sell are, are dual category items, like a lot of the ba military badges, they'll either go in collectors, military, say World War II badges, or they'll go in collectors items, badges and patches, military badges. So I'll put them in both. No that's, extra a quite a major, that's quite a major perk of the anchor store, isn't it? To be able to yeah. do that for to, free. To, listed, listed to two categories, yeah. Um, Have you seen a, a lot of improvements since you switched to 7-day? Was that recently, Ken, you did that? that I've, been doing it for about, I've been doing it for about 10 months now. Oh, right. My sale, yeah, my, my sales are increasing. All I think I started, well, maybe not 10 months, maybe. It was when I took the anchor store on us. I did it because I wouldn't. Be, you wouldn't be able to do, afford to do it on any other level. Not with my level of stock. I worked it out. If I if I if I still kept the featured store and run seven day listings and listed in two categories, I think my, my insertion fees would have been about a thousand quid a month. So it's just not even worth bothering with, you know. Um, do you but, see, yeah, do you about see, October, yeah. November. When you do a relist, do you see a spike when you relist a load of stuff, and do you still see that they they sell as they're coming to an end? Usually, yeah. I mean, today's been quiet for a Thursday. I had a brilliant Tuesday and Wednesday, but usually Thursday, when although the bulk of two and a half thousand of my three and a half thousand listings finish on a Thursday, and I usually sell ten ten items on a Thursday. That's usually my yeah. best day of the week. Not every week, but you'd say eight out of ten weeks is the best day of the week. That can't be a coincidence, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I mean, I've, I think I noticed, I, I actually took your advice on that, Ken, um, and I'm not doing seven days, but I decided to uh, try out ten days. And I think that, the because I was having the dilemma that if you keep it on good till cancelled, you can use eBay's markdown manager, can't you, to run... To run, yeah, I can't sales. use anything like that. Yeah. No, yeah, I can't, I can't try through. But I've got to say, after speaking to you and switching to doing ten-day listings, I find I get more sales by doing the more, you know, the, the because yeah. when the listings are ending and when they're fresh, you just pick up the odd sale, and I think yeah. that that kind of negates the benefit of being able to of, of running like um. You know, like a markdown manager selling. It's, it's like it's like saying now, if you listed twenty items, new yeah. items, one or two nearly always sell, don't they, straight away? Yeah. So if you're doing ten day listings, that one or two that sell straight away repeats themselves three times a month. Exactly. You know, so yeah. you you just get instead of getting the th on a thirty day listing, you get the peak at the beginning for a couple of days. You get the peak at the end. So in every thirty days, you're getting four peak days really yeah if you're running 10 day listings you're getting 12 peak days a month you're getting a two days every week at the start or well, every 10 days and two days at the end so you know you, your items are being seen more 
Um, and if you've got the featured shop, which is the middle level of shop that gives you 1,200 listings, it's worth doing if you've got. A, it's worth upgrading to the featured shop if you've got four or five hundred listings because you can run most of them on ten days then days. for no yeah. extra cost. You that's know, exact, that's exactly where I'm at. Um, just I mean, it's always say, fifty quid a month. Yeah. Just to say, we've got um, 71 people watching now, which is really good. So thanks for sticking with the tech gremlins. Yeah, thanks for um, sticking with us. Yeah. And we've got a couple of other questions. Um, this is for all of us. Gary asks, um, Gary Dunster asks, how, how long do you all leave an item on sale for on eBay? So, um, Ken, like, how long do you leave an item before actually deciding it's not going to sell or would you disagree with it that? It stays on there forever. Until doomsday, <laughs> Ken leaves it on. <laughs> I couldn't care That's less. Once it's, once it's on, my work's done until it sells. All it is is a storage issue then. I think people get hung up on this too much. You've got to look at it this way. You've bought the item, you've paid for it. That money's gone. You've got the item on the shelf. You've just got to wait for the customer. I mean, if, if department stores and antique centres and real big businesses panicked where they don't sell something and started slashing the prices they'd be going bankrupt you've <laughs> got to you know you've got to wait for that item to for that specific customer you can't unless it's something fashionable like clothes or whatever you when you've got that set window you know like women are wearing mini skirts at the moment and maybe the next fashion that's going to come in are long skirts and you've got to get rid of your mini skirts but if it's if it's items that don't have a sell by date What's the yeah. panic? I, I think what happens is, unfortunately, people get confused and start modelling themselves on massive multinational companies. Um, Tesco. Well, we're not Tesco. Well, that exactly. That's my point. But unfortunately, I think people do get affected by it. Um, and and if something doesn't sell, they start cutting and slashing their prices a bit too quickly. Tesco's can afford to do it because it's a multi-billion-pound business. Um, you know, and and they can afford to to sell you things at a quid that that may have been selling for twenty. A small business wouldn't do that. Um, well, you can't absorb that. You can't it's... absorb that level. And if you're and having, me... yeah, if you're having to do that, you're making wrong buying decisions. I mean, Nick, what's yeah. your opinion on this? And, and to me, I don't ever expect anything to sell quick. Yeah, yeah. I, oh. I'm slightly different in that I, I do try and get a quicker turnover. And on bigger ticket items, sometimes I will drop it a bit to get that sale so I can reinvest that in faster moving stuff. I've done that before. But I agree with you, Ken, that if you can wait long enough, you will find a buyer. But that's just not how my store operates. And it's not really the sort of stuff I have really. My stuff, it, it, most of it is competing with 100 or 200 other people with exactly the same thing on there. So sometimes I have to play a bit clever to get the sale. Um, yeah, it's a completely different business model though, isn't it? You know, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for a specific customer and it doesn't matter. If I put a, an item on that's worth a thousand quid, that's really, really obscure, if I put it on for a hundred, there's every chance it'll sit there for just as long as it would do if I put it on for a thousand. Because the yeah. one guy who wants it, of course he'll snap it up at a hundred, but it's just this one guy I'm waiting for, or two guys. You know, I mean, I bought a crate of milk bottles a few weeks ago for 20 quid. And like, people in the auction are looking at me like, like I'm mad. But they're all like these ones with like the name of the farm on all done like uh, enamel, you know. And I've. I bought, paid 20 quid for the crate. I've sold three straight away for £20 each. Now, you think, who's going to buy a milk bottle for £20? But there is collectors out there for that item. There's not many of them. But they're out there, yeah. They're out there. But if oh, I yeah. put them on at a quid each, they would have sold at a quid each. You know, it's it, the price isn't always the factor. Not, not in my market, anyway. You, no, know, it's, you, know, you know I had those bottles, Ken. And I listed, yeah. um, I listed about two-thirds of them, the ones that I thought had value. And that, um, what's it, ginger beer one. I, I've had an offer on that of a tenner, which I declined. I thought it's worth more than that. Yeah, there was, I, I go usually on those about £25, you know, 20 to £25, the ginger beer, depending on how nice they are, you know. But again, yeah. there's not a massive market for that sort of stuff. It, no, it, it, it's it's going to sit about, you know. Like you were saying before, what I do and what you do, generally we're very different, although I do dabble in the antiques and collectibles as well. But with a lot of what I sell, if I list an item, let's say it's a computer game or it's a, a CD or whatever, I know that they are selling prob probably on eBay perhaps 100 a day of that particular item might be selling. And yeah. there'll be another 100 listed tomorrow. So I have to 
play a bit clever to get the sale. Yeah. That's the only yeah. difference. Whereas you, rightfully, well, you're, have... You're selling, you're selling consumer durables, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're selling right. current consumer items that are still probably on sale in CEX and places like that. The, yeah, yeah. The, the, the readily available items, it's completely different. Where like he was here with his electronics, he's selling more sort of like... It's, it's items that are not available anymore. Best so you're looking stuff. for a specific sort of person, you know. Um, just, an, um, just to mention again, we're up to 76 watches, and um, you've got a question here, Ken, from Gary again, um, who's saying, Ken, have you thought about setting up a business where you value these items for other people? Maybe a website such as makeupaprice.com. Makeupaprice.com, <laughs> well, yeah. Um, I go on that all the time. That. Yeah, have you thought of oh. that as a business, maybe where you are, where you'd what, where make up price dot com? Make up yeah. work for, for someone, yeah. People people yeah. come to you and ask you for the value well, wherever, of items. Wherever, yeah, but the trouble is, I only guess, you know. Um, <laughs> I, I, mean, I, I went I, on I, your website, Ken, when I priced up those bottles. <laughs> yeah, it's it's brilliant, you know. You just sort of like make up a price and add twenty percent, and usually you're about <laughs> right, you know. Um, I, I think we should have a website it. like that, Ken, and you should actually sample your voice so you can actually give the price to the, the person on the website. That would be yeah. really cool. Yeah. I think it well, was when I chatted it, with you before, Ken, when we chatted before, and um, when you've got something that is a bit random, bit unique, bit out there, you, you tidy it up and then you think, oh, now it's worth about 20. Take a nice picture. Maybe I'll ask 30. And then you write the description and you go, fuck it, I'll put it on at 50. Who cares? Yeah. Inflation's rife in my sort of like my listing process. It, <laughs> it gains value the more I look at it, you know. And yeah. uh, but I do that a lot. But I, I showed on a sales report recently, and I showed you guys in in, in private chat about that tin that I bought. I bought for two pounds, sold for three hundred and fifty. That tobacco tin, you know, the Tommy Atkins uh, tobacco tin. Yeah. Now with that, I had no idea what it was worth. But obviously, I'm in and around tins a lot. I buy a lot of tins. I could tell it was a good one. There was not anywhere, there was not on the internet. The last person who mentioned one on the internet was in 2012. Some bloke on a forum said, I really need to get one of these tins. Like, and that was like four years ago. Right. So I've got no clue what it's worth. So basically, I just went onto eBay and I just looked at the highest price for okay. tobacco tins in general. Yeah. And I saw the highest one I sold for 300 So I thought, well, I'll price mine at 300 and I thought, well, no, to be on the safe side, I'll stick another 50 quid on it and put it at 350 best <laughs> offer. And it, and it sold. The, that was like at 8 o'clock at night. And the guy who bought it, he didn't even bother with the best offer because I think he was that worried about somebody else buying it while the offer was outstanding because he'd, he'd, he'd done it at midnight. You know what I mean? He was probably thinking, if I put best offer on this, somebody might just nip in and buy it at 1 o'clock in the morning. So, you know, I got me full 350, 350 quid and it sold the same day. I just had a feeling about it. I, I knew it was a good one, you know, uh, but I didn't expect it to go that quick. Uh, you know, I thought I was going to be able to look at it for a bit and admire it and what have you. Um, so I got me 350 quid. And then I went to uh, York Car Boot, which is a bit of a, a misnomer, really, because York Car Boot is really an antiques fair. They call it a car boot, but it's just full of antiques dealers. And there was a guy there selling some, uh, me and Steve went, and there was a guy there selling some uh, tobacco tins and cigarette tins and what have you. And I said to him, I said, oh, I, said, I, I sold a Tommy Atkins for 350 quid uh, a couple of weeks ago. And he was really interested because he wanted one. He said, I didn't see it on eBay. Where was it and all this? I said, well, it went really quick. Like, I said, got 350 quid for it. And he went, yeah, he said, that's about right. That's about the value. And I just made that value up, but it actually was what it was worth. So, you know what I mean? Make up at a price dot com. But <laughs> it's a confidence thing, isn't it? Yeah, Ken, reselling you know. asks, um, have you ever considered framing, say, six similar or regional postcards in a cheap frame and selling them that way? It might appeal to free houses and cafes. Have you ever thought of that? No, I haven't thought of that, actually. It's probably quite a good idea. Um, yeah, yeah, That's good quite, idea. Yeah, nice little suggestion there, yeah. Yeah. So. There's always different ways of doing things. I mean, I saw that. I don't know if any of you have seen those princess trays. We you know what they used to keep the princess blocks in, They're like a drawer, and people hang them on the wall. They put little knickknacks in them, don't they? Do you know what I mean? The princess tray. Yeah. Well, there's a guy. I, I went. I saw. So I thought, hang on a minute. I've seen a few of these princess trays. I've actually got a drawer unit behind, but it's full of them. But it's actually the full unit. So I'd, I'd be selling that as a unit. Got all my Lego in it at the moment. But uh, 
yeah. So I look at these printers trays. So I put, uh, I looked at the sold listing, the highest one, 95 quid it sold for. But all it was was this guy had got this printers tray and he was doing like different themes on them. So he had a gambling themed one. So he put a playing card in one section, a few poker chips, a couple of dice, a couple of little cigarette advertisements. And he made his own little themed piece of artwork within this printers tray. And it's sort of like, someone will see that and think, oh yeah, that looks effective. And they're buying it, and he's getting like instead of getting forty quid, he's getting ninety five quid, and he's just took a few little bits of tat in it, you know, glued them in to make it look like a piece of art. So Sounds it can be done. Great. Sounds you fantastic. Know. Don't I mean, Nick's, that Nick's not a, a, yeah. I mean, Nick's not averse to bundling. I mean, Nick, you do that quite often as well. Even with some of your items, you make up. You you you'll look to add value, like you said, where you can to to gain well, an advantage, especially when it comes to things like your Playmobil, Lego, that kind of item, especially. I think sometimes you need to get a, a bundle up to a price where it's worth doing as well. So it's like if you if you do the little lots of Playmobil, it's quite a lot of work for a fiver here and a fiver there. Whereas if you do a set up a nice bundle and then you can ask twenty five quid for it. You know, it's a substantial sale. Plus, also, it makes you stand out if you can make a bundle, like with books and stuff, and Nerf stuff. If you can make a bundle and just make it add add a bit of value to it, that's exactly right what you said. So you and and make yourself stand out. That's the point of it, yeah, I think. I I should remember. I think it was books was the first time I heard you talk about this, where you were putting together. I can't remember the author now, but. Um, you know, you 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 were picking up books for like twenty pence each, but suddenly by bundling a few together, you could get a reasonable amount. Whereas if you were to sell them on their own, you'd be lucky to get a pound plus postage for them. Yeah, well, with books, a lot of books, you're, you're looking at a pound per book. But when you add the postage on that, no one's going to buy one. But like you say, if you can pick them up for ten p and you just just grab them whenever you see them. Once you get twenty, and you mm. ask twenty quid with six ninety nine postage, you, and you can get it. It makes sense, whereas um, there's no point in selling them individually. Uh, Ryan Brown has asked, um, so I guess to all of us, do you ever lower the price slightly so that everyone that has the item on their watch list like gets a, a notification, like free advertising? What, what do you say to that, Ken? No, no, I don't do that. <laughs> nice and short answer from Ken there. What no, about you? Well, the thing is, is it's oh, okay. like, you know... Um, I don't have a lot of watches. I'm on seven-day listings, so it's very rare that I get a lot of watches on, on right. anything, really. Eight, eight. If I look at my souls now, eight out of ten items don't have a watcher. Oh, yeah. Don't get carried away with watches. You know, the, it does. It means next to nothing, watches, honestly. Um, even when I get, like, I've got an item on at the moment now, it's, it's on its second seven-day run. A little Huntley. It was when we went to the boot sale to here. Do you remember that little Huntley and Palmer tin that was shaped like a cottage? Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Paid, paid 15 quid for it. Well, I've got it on for 125. And, um, you know, well, it's a nice tin. But um, there's, there's like nine or ten watchers on it, but none of them have bought it. Do you know what I mean? It, it might go ten, ten runs before somebody buys it. Yeah. Yeah, I I have done that actually, uh, and to effect, I've also done it the other way where you put it up a pound, and then suddenly you get a sale. So yeah, yeah there is there is some logic to it, but don't go expecting this to work every time. Uh, I think we were chatting once with um, Soup or Fake Rachel, and uh, she's used that to to good effect. I think I think it was Rachel. But, yeah, yeah, I think I used it on a pram and it worked. Yeah. Um, I, 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 got, I got a sale from doing that by just raising it a little bit. We've actually jumped up to 81 watches now, so 81 Good people God. watching. 81 watches, yeah. 80 people watching this, 81 people watching this. So thanks, everyone. Um, Retro Boot Disc asks, Ken, do you think it makes a difference with two categories? Uh, like, do most people search items by name or actually look for an item by category? Well, obviously, you're going to get a certain people who are just going to search by name. But there are people who shop by category, because I shop by category myself. When I'm doing my eBay snipes, I go into a category and I look at everything that's been listed that day. So you will pick up some extra extra sales by category. Um, but also what you've got to bear in mind is, is that, say you're selling say, an Art Deco clock, for example. It's going to go in clocks, but it will also go in Art Deco. Now, your guy who collects Art Deco he's going to look in the Art Deco section. He's not going to look in clocks. But he might not even be thinking about buying a clock, but he loves his Art Deco. 
right? So he's looking at he's, he's he's constantly every day he looks in Art Deco all the time because he's looking for anything new that he's not seen before that he thinks is good value. So he's he's looking through Art Deco and suddenly thinks, oh, that's a nice clock. He's not even thinking about buying a clock. <laughs> but because it matches what he wants, it's made it's Art Deco. He thinks, yeah, that's nice. So you're going to pick up those sort of sales. But you do get people who who just like I say, they just look for specific items. But you also get people who just browse through through eBay because I I browse yeah. through eBay all the time. That's the word that I was going to use. Is is you've got to get in the headspace of somebody who is a a collector, an addict, you know, and they just want to scratch that itch and buy something. And I used to be a big collector, and and I'd go to antiques fairs and just browse until I find something I want. Those are the sort of people that you're talking about, Ken, that will go into the military yeah. category and keep looking and keep looking until they find something that that satisfies their need to buy it. Whereas and this this is oh sorry, carry on, Nick. Yeah. Whereas going back to the you know what I sell most of the time, somebody will just search you know Beatles Let It Be album it will pop up and they'll buy it you know it, it doesn't matter to them which one they're buying whereas yeah, the browsers are, are looking for something unique aren't they yeah and this is why I, I went on the, the recent eBay uh, webinar about uh, item specifics and if you look on a mobile app now the description doesn't even show uh, you've got to click on the description uh, when, when, when an item comes up the first thing you see is the condition report. You see the photographs, then you see the condition report. Now, a lot of people on a used item never fill that in. They just leave it as used, and all you get is the generic eBay, this item is used, blah de blah de blah may contain, you know. So they don't fill that in. So that doesn't show on a mobile app straight away. The person can't see what the condition is. And then they don't fill in the item specifics. Now, on some things like in Militaria, you know, you've got the answer specifics. Is it World War One or World War Two? Now, people will search by that. So, if you don't fill that in, say you've got a set of World War One medals, and you've not put it's a Great Britain medal in the item specifics. This guy's searching for Great British medals, so you know you're out of the game straight away. You know what I mean? If you've not put the, what country it's from, you've not put whether it was issued or not issued, and you've not filled those item specifics in, every time you miss an item specific, you're knocking a chunk of customers because they filter their search down by those item specifics. Yeah. And that is why a lot of people now, when you see on the forums, are complaining that the, the sales have dropped because they're not for mobile, uh, for mobile sales. And the, and, the, and the app sales on tablets and stuff, because it's all down to item specifics of that condition report. The, the, the description, that long convoluted description that people put with all these terms and conditions and sense and text and the text moving into 3,000 different colours and, you know, I've been on eBay 16 years and, like, if you buy me stuff, I'll give you a blowjob or whatever, you know, all that <laughs> is not, you know, it's not, not needed. It's just, all, it doesn't even show on the mobile. You go on, a mob, on your mobile now and you search an item, you have to click to get the description. The only thing that shows on that item, like I say, is the photograph of that list of specifics. And that's what people are buying from. Yeah. You know what I mean? They want to know whether it's... Like, with a tin, all the, all the specifics are on the tin. Is like, if it's original or reproduction, you are used. And obviously, if it's used, you've got to put the condition. So when I go on the mobile app, and it sees one of my tins, it'll say, uh, in good antique condition, with age-related marks, and some small dents on the lid and that comes up straight on the app underneath the photograph so he's looking at it he's seen it he can see that and it's got underneath original tin made in the uk but if you don't put those i those very specific items in people who search and narrow searches down like where they start off thinking right yeah i want a tin i don't want a new tin i want a used tin because a lot, because on eBay as well, you can just put that little dash, can't you? You got used, new, and a lot of people just put a little, the little dash where you don't know whether it's new or new, new, new or used. So people who are just lazy and do that, someone who's looking for a new, like when I look for tins, I'm looking for a used tin. I don't want a new tin. I don't want some like round trees tin from last week. So I just get rid of all them in my search, but I narrow the search down. So if you don't put that it's a used tin, suddenly you're not in that guy's search then. You've yeah. gone. 
You I've know, got another good what... question here, just to move along to the next one, because we've got qu a couple more coming through. Um, it's a quite a good one here from Gary. Uh, he asks, do you think you can ever overprice something? That's quite an interesting question. Do you think yeah, you can overprice yeah, you, something? Yeah, of yeah. course you can. Everything, everything does have a have a limit. I've, got, I've put something on for 700 quid at the moment. I haven't got a clue what it's worth, but I was talking to Neil, uh, Neil Borden, and he liked it. And he said, uh, put it on for 500. So I thought, well, I better be on the safe side and put it on for seven. So, you know. <laughs> but I, I saw that. That's quite a nice looking item. That's quite old, isn't yeah, it? Is, well, it's, yeah, it's, 18, it's yeah. 1828. It's a, a silver gilt snuff box. And I've seen ones go for 400 uh, anyway. Well, the thing with this one is, it's owned by somebody who's got like a Wikipedia page. Right, and it's also it, it's also he, I've also got the copy of his commission into it's it's got like the Royal uh, Sherwood Fusiliers or something like that on it. So no Royal Sherwood Militia, uh, Royal Sherwood Foresters I should say, which was a militia unit. So the thing is, is that it's anyone who collects that particular regiment, this is like the Holy Grail. You're not going to find another one, you know. So I have to price it accordingly, really, just in case I get a real top collector in, you know. I think I think you're right there. I mean, I, I think you can definitely price things just too high, and in the end, your buyers will let you know by by probably watching the item, but not actually making any offers, because if they think you're so far away from reality, it will put some people off even making offers, even if you've got best offers enabled. Nick, what's your opinion on this? Yeah, well, one example, a lot of my stuff doesn't really come into this sort of stuff. You, you can search it, you can find out how much it's worth, and that's what, what I list it for. But recently, you remember I had that sealed Lego set from 1950, yeah. whatever it was, yeah. and I had no reference as to what that was worth. It's more in your sort of um, style of make up a price, Ken, really, and I, I stuck it on at 350 quid because I thought... I have no idea if it what it's worth, and there's I've got nothing to lose by putting it on ridiculously high, and it had a lot of views, a lot of watches, and no interest. So I left it on for a couple of cycles, and then I dropped it down to 250. I had an offer. The biggest offer I had was 150, and I actually turned that down. That was fairly early on, and then it went on another couple of cycles. I think it was on for four months, and eventually I started getting offers around 100 pounds, and then I took one, and I that to me, taught, told me that's about its price because it had yeah. been on four months. It had thousands of views, thousands and thousands, lots and lots of questions. And I but, figured I, I'd had enough information to figure that it was worth 100 and that's what I took. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's quite an interesting um, like thing to actually note down, though, isn't it? Because that was a really rare item. I mean, any Lego fan who, who would have found that, especially because it was still in its original seal from, was it like 70s or 60s, Nick? I think it was either early 60s or late 50s yeah. even. Oh, it was, wow. It had, yeah. it had a certain logo that was only issued, and I can't remember the, the dates now, but yeah, it was really early. So, it was set number, set number 10. The, exactly. It was so that's such a unique item. I think my initial reaction as well would be just to, you know, it's got to be worth a ton. But you know, soon I think your buyers do bring you down to reality when, like you said, you get a lot of watches, a lot of comments, uh, but no one actually, it, you know, commits to making you an offer. So that's one thing that I don't really. Now that I've got thousands of items on, I never look. When I only do like say five to six hundred up to a thousand, I used to be always watching that. How many people are watching? How many people have viewed it? I don't look at anything like that now. All I concentrate on is listing. So to me, I don't even get involved in it because it's such a time drain where you're sort of like trying to micromanage the thoughts of buyers that you don't even know exist. I just don't even. I just forget about it. You know what I mean? I just all I think about is the more I put on, the more is going to sell. You know, yeah. and, it, and that does make sense. But I, I quite often do when, when my items finish. If it's a fairly high value item, anyway, I'll go into it and think: Has it been viewed? Uh, you know, is any does anybody care? <laughs> you know what I mean? And and assess it, and then relook at my competition sometimes, and assess yeah. why are people not looking at this? Are people flogging them way cheaper? Do I actually need to reassess it and change the price? But I think you're right. When you get into the thousands of items listed, you can't actually spend that time assessing it. But you may have items listed for sure, Ken, that nobody's looking at and they're just 
languishing, surely. There must be a few like that. Oh, yeah, but the thing is, is I always, if you, anyone watches my sales reports, I'll always say, I've had this for two years. Yeah. I've had this for 18 months. So these items, and some of them are like really, you know, not great items because they're the, from like when I had two years less experience, but they're still selling. Um, and I don't necessarily think that if I give the stock away, that I'd make any more money. I might make a few more sales, but no profit. So there's no point. So to me, it's like my mate's got a brick and mortar store, and I've been going in there for three years. And there's items in that brick and mortar store that have been there for three years. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's nothing new in the antiques trade. You, can, if you're a regular at an antique centre, I can guarantee you there'll be something in there that catches your eye, and it's been catching your eye for the last four years because it's still there because it's waiting for that customer. You know, I'm not yeah. selling like fish and chips. You know, I'm selling like stuff that's specific items. I mean, if I was in your shoes, Nick, with all the media and everything. It's like with these die casts, there is, I put the code of, like, say I've got a Corgi truck, Corgi 7502, I put it into eBay, and I can see the range of the prices that it's sold for. Yeah. So, obviously, there might be a few chances in there have got ridiculous prices on it, but you go into the sold listings, the highest one sold for 20 quid. I know that I'm going to get 20 quid for it, because it's a, a mass-produced item, it's easily checkable, it's got a code, you know, it's not like as if, like, you know, he, he, it's not like something like a World War One postcard that no one's ever seen before. You know, it's 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 just a, a mass-produced toy, basically, collector's item. So I can't suddenly think, well, yeah, I'll go to makeupofthepriced.com and charge 60 quid for this because the highest one one's ever sold for is 20 and there's 15 sold in the last three months and, like, the highest one's 20 it's exactly. worth 20 quid you and know when you, that's a when, you thing, list you know. Yours, when you list yours ken you, you can guarantee there'll be another 20 listed so there's no point yeah. in over exaggerating no. the price no. because it's, it's not realistic so yeah that's that's my world pretty much <laughs> but when it's a unique item it, that's engraved or whatever to a certain person there ain't another one in the world no. i mean it's like that piece of last year i sold that i had a, a carving from the cathedral that's uh on the Somme, on the Somme battlefront that got bombed, I had a piece of the altar. And it took me a year to sell that. And I bought it on eBay for 80 quid, and I got three, just short of 300, I think, when I, when I finally sold it. Wow. Um, but I had to wait. I had to wait a year. And the guy who bought it was some sort of religious guy because he went to, like, a, a religious college, you know, when, when I sent it there. So it had to be that specific guy who wanted it. You know what I mean? It was... It was a unique item. You're not going to find another one anywhere. It was unique. Okay. Yeah. You okay there? Or have I gone black? No, no. <laughs> I was just actually talking to Andrea. She's just about to leave to go to Girl Guides. <laughs> All right. I was listening, Kim. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's, it's horses for courses with that sort of stuff, you know. If, you, if you're into selling the more unique stuff, you will get a premium and you can virtually like say make up your own price but if you're buying stuff that's a consumer durable you are governed by the market you know uh, with like with your computer games they do some of them do have gone up in price because of rarity and what have you but you are governed by what other people are getting for them aren't you you can't just suddenly think hang on a minute you know this Mario Kart's worth 80 quid and everyone else is selling it for 15 because it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's in abundance. It's an item that's in abundance. So you're yeah, never well, going to be able to do that. It's, it's the basics of supply and demand. And essentially what you're saying, Ken, is your stuff on the whole, there's there's very little supply because they are that rare or unique or whatever. But also the, well, demand, the, items, yeah. the demand is very low as well. So that's why you have to play a different yeah. game. Now, we've been on for about an hour roughly um, so we'll wrap it up soon but we need to talk about something that's happening next Tuesday Kenneth <laughs> what's that Nick uh, well oh yes next Tuesday yeah now a lot you, of you uh, watching you, this do you just end the call then shall I tell them yeah yeah go yeah, for it the, 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 yeah the, the longer waited appearance of uh, Caroline, Nick and myself on uh, the BBC programme, uh, what is it, Look After Your Money, is it, what's it called, Right on the Money? Right on the Money. Yeah, Right on the Money is on next Tuesday at 9.15am, 
uh, and we'll see if the future of reselling changes after 9.15am on Tuesday. But I don't think it will, folks. I don't think you need to worry. Um, but, yeah, if anybody's interested in watching three middle-aged uh, people wandering around the shittiest car boot in the world <laughs> on it a was, freezing though, cold February morning... It, it was... I don't know how it's going to look. I mean, obviously, we've not seen any of this footage. We don't know how it's going to be edited. We don't know how we're going to be portrayed. And I am not really looking... Are you going to watch it, King? Because I'm not looking forward to it. I think I might video it and just leave it, you know, and maybe <laughs> watch it after a few pints or something. Yeah. But, uh, but the thing is, is that, I mean, Nick, I, I, you found three items, didn't you? Caroline found about five or six. I think I found about ten, but you don't need to worry about my items because the majority of resellers don't sell what I sell anyway. Um, I don't even know who, who won the competition, by the way. Do you know? Oh, we better not say. Oh, right. It's a big secret. I don't even know. Well, they never told me who won, you know, but... Uh, Oh, I thought you yeah, knew. Anyway. I, th I thought you knew that. Yeah. I was told. Was you? Yeah. And well, then Caroline I, and then... told me. Caroline told me, but I never had it confirmed. Let's put it that way. That's what I'm saying. Oh uh, well, Caroline wasn't told at one point, and then I wouldn't tell her, and I was winding her up for ages. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, Ca Caroline's that worried. She's gone. She's in Greece at the moment to escape. Uh, to escape the uh, the flack that will follow our little brief appearance on uh, mainstream TV. Um, so she's done one. So there's, there's me, me and Nick are left here. Like, but, yeah, it, I don't think it's going to be a problem. Um, Nick didn't pick up much great, many great things. I mean, I had to point him in the direction of two of his finds. That's how good <laughs> it was. I found two of his items for him. So if he has one, uh, it was down to me, folks, because I found the items. <laughs> <laughs> it's true though, Nick. I did, didn't I? Yeah. Well, what was it? You, you pointed out um, there was that the sta cat. statuette and those yeah. those poxy meerkat things. Thing is, I was struggling. It was a a proper crap boot sale, and I it wandered was bad. around. Uh, Ken went one way, I went the other, and we kind of met up. And I was like, "There's naff all here." And he said, "Well, I've seen some meerkats up that way." <laughs> yeah, and a, a sort of like action. What was that action figure thing? That was an Assassin's Creed uh, statue, yeah. and I made a lot of money on that. That was yeah. good. Yeah, the, the, I'd spotted those two, and I thought, well, they're right up your street, you know. But it was, it was, God knows why they dragged us down there to that. There must have been a 100 better boot sales that weekend all over the country, wasn't they? It was horrendous. It was, You know, all the way down to Peterborough for that. I mean, yeah. it was like dodgy as anything, wasn't it? But... <laughs> uh, Anyway, it's all in the can now, and it's it's on next Tuesday. But like I say, Nick, we don't know what we're going to look like. We could look like biggish bunch of dicks going, couldn't we, really? I, Probably I can will. just imagine some really sarcastic voiceover saying, and this is Nick, he buys second-hand crap and puts it on eBay. Make up your <laughs> own that, minds. <laughs> it's that Dom fella, isn't it? That, that, that bloke off Heroes and Villains, He's the he'll be the voiceover guy, won't he? Um, and here we are now looking for some bargains, uh, you know. But it's, it's uh, what I'm saying, it's like the thing was, was, you know, like all these myths that people say about the car boot and stuff. I mean, I was going around finding stuff and I had a cameraman stood next to me. Like people say, oh, you know, if they, if they know you're a dealer, they want, they're not going to sell to you. Well, hang on a minute, I'm stood there, I've got a cameraman next to me and I'm negotiating with this woman. I said, how much do you want for that, love? quid so she didn't think like oh eight quid or something because he's he's going to resell it and, and what have you it's just the you know all these people get into all this thing like can't let people know i'm a reseller uh you know it's it's all a load, absolute load of rubbish i mean as a hero will tell you <clears throat> when i go to the car boot i tell everybody that i'm going to sell it on and it doesn't usually get a negative response usually i get a positive response because if they know you're a dealer and you're looking at stuff, I say, well, yeah, I'm going to buy it. I like that, okay, I like can, that. I like can I say other. something? I, I've seen that in action from yourself. That's true. You do say that. However, what I would say, it is also very much dependent, again, on what you deal in. Now, yeah. if you're going up to a gentleman that's accrued a bunch of vintage antique items, they have dealt at some point to get that stock. Um, yeah. And it's same same with us as well. If, 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 if we go up to... Um, like a dealer, so someone who deals in video games, 
you could probably tell them that you're looking to make some money if you're looking to buy in bulk and they might do you a deal. However, if you're looking at buying the kind of mainstream items that we like to buy as well, like the more regular items from a family, it could potentially rub some people up the wrong way because not everyone likes, um, I mean we've all heard plenty of stories where, where sellers refuse to sell to buyers just because they know that even though it's none of their business what you're going to do with the item, there's some, they suddenly take a moral high ground and decide they're not going to sell it to you because you're going to make a profit, whereas so and so has said, oh, it's for their, um, it's for their child, you know, with you know, no teeth or something. It, you know. I think it's also to hear even with mm. that. I mean, I've bought off private sellers myself. You know, um, it's how you approach them. I mean. I go up to it, I see a few things, I say, God, you've got some really great stuff here. Uh, get a few items together, say, you know, and I'm friendly with them. I don't start like this thing where you get these people who they go into a boot sale, and the first thing they're doing is they're chipping it down, they're knocking, they're, knocking the, they're trying to knock the confidence of the, of, of, of the seller down in terms of, like, they start slagging the stock off, they start saying this is wrong with it, that's wrong with it. You get them, if you get them on a friendly footing, usually you're going to get some sort of results. But what I do a lot of the time is, is like I'll get two or three items, and I'll say how much for the for these three items or whatever, and he'll say, well, I want thirty for that, I want forty for that, so I want hundred quid all round. I say, yeah, right, I'm tempted, I'm really tempted, and then I just go quiet. I don't say anything, and I just carry on looking at the stuff, and I leave it for them. And then that silent period usually starts saying. But if you want all three, I can let you have it for 60 or I can let you have it for 70. But I do it that way. I don't sort of like bully them into it. I say, yeah, they're great items. I love all of them. Uh, but, you know, yeah, I'm tempted. But, you know. Uh, well, what, what you're doing um, essentially is putting the fear of losing the sale into their head, aren't you? Yeah. I've, yeah. I've actually done the thing where I, I, I almost do a deal with someone and then and then start walking off. And then, then you get there, wait, come back. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, you don't have because you see these aggressive buyers, don't you? They say, what, you try to sell that and look at that and the, it's rubbish and, you know, and they're, they're knocking the stock down. And you, uh, you, you get that seller onto a bad footing. If you're there friendly and you're saying, oh, you've got some nice items and that, you're hitting it with positives all the time. Yeah, yeah. You, you sort the price out. And the thing is, is like with, as well, like people say, oh, you know, like people are charging too much at car boots, but let's get it right. That seller's got the right to ask for as much as they want. Yeah. You know, if, if you go there and there's somebody who wants to is trying to sell something for what it's really worth, and cause it just because just it doesn't suit you and you can't make the profit, and they, they're going to get try to get most of their money back, you can't get upset about that. You just move on. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. if I go to an antiques fair, I know that some of the items are going to be overpriced, some of them are going to be bang on retail, and there'll be the odd item here and there that's underpriced. It's my job to find the underpriced items. It's not the job of the seller to sell me his premium stock for next to nothing. Do you know what I mean? And you've got to have that. That's you've got to realise that. And it's the same with charity shops. If something's worth 30 quid and the charity shop knows that that's what it's worth, I mean, I know they do ridiculous prices sometimes, but they know it's worth a 30 quid item. Why should they sell it to you for two pound? It doesn't make economic sense. So you can't get upset when businesses do that because they are a business at the end of the day. And you just move on. You've just always got to accept that there'll be things that are out of your price range and there'll be things that are in your price range. Is that there'll be things that you can make money on and things that you can't make money on. It's exactly the same at the auctions. I have a set limit to where I'm going to bid. If that goes up to like five times what I'm prepared to bid, I don't get upset about it. I just go to the next thing. Yeah, just move on. You know, it's all you got to do. You got to look at it. I think people get too emotionally involved. You know, like they go to the they go to the boot sale. They go, good God, every you know he wanted an eBay price for it. Well, if he wants an eBay price for it, that is his prerogative. Whether he sells it or not, that's his. That's up to him. Nothing, nothing, nothing to do with you. You know what I mean? It yeah. just, it just winds me up when people say, "Oh yeah, you know, he wouldn't sell me a thirty-pound item for two quid." Well, tell you what, if I was at a boot sale, I wouldn't sell you a thirty-pound item for two quid either. <laughs> you know what I mean? It just wouldn't happen. You know, and if you were selling it, at, you were selling it, you wouldn't sell it for, for for that lower price. But there will be somebody along the line there who's got a load of gear they want to clear out. It might not be gear that you're used to buying, but there'll be something there 
even the shittest boot sale that you'll be able to do a deal on and make money on. Yeah. I don't care what it is. But, you know, Actually, don't get upset, you know. It's a good point, then, that... Uh, I was chatting to Tom about this actually. When when we all met up recently, uh, you guys have probably seen the video of when we all got together in Hitchin. A bunch of us went to the boot sale on Saturday. There was me, Tom, Sean, Mike, Caroline. All of us kind of, you know, really know what we're looking for. Hard hitting, steam around the boot sale people. And we all came away with a load of good stuff from a couple of very average boot sales. And we all kind of said afterwards that, you know, there's plenty of stuff out there, but you just have Slow to know it's all about the knowledge. So. There's loads of stuff. But the thing is, is you can't always, what I'm saying is you can't always go in expecting that everything there will be the price you want it to be, you know. Um, I mean, yeah. I don't even look in charity shops anymore. I'd never bother with charity shops. It's, to me, it's a waste of time. I'm not going to waste a morning going around hoping that I'll find three things that I can make a ten pound ten pound profit on it. I'd rather go to the auction, spend five hundred quid, and buy two grand's worth of stock, and work my way through it. That's the, that's the way I've gone now. I'm I've, I'm not being big headed or anything, but I've gone too far to start fiddling about with little bits and pieces. It's just not worth my time. You know, I, I could I could go and buy... I mean, my mate at the vintage shop this week, he had a load of record magazines in, really, really old ones. And they were worth about 12 quid each. And he said, do you want to buy a couple of... He had every year from, like, 1964 to 1975, all the ones with Hendrix, really good stuff. Some of them were worth more. He said, well, you buy, do you want to buy a year off me for 60 quid? I said, what, five for a copy? And, you know, you're going to get 12. I said, it's just not worth bothering with. Um, and the thing is, I said, I'm not being funny, but I could go to the auction and I could probably buy that whole job lot if it crops up at the auction for 20 quid. Yeah. And that's the difference. I can, you know, I could go out and I could buy as much stock as I want at really, really good prices. So, to me... It's got to be worth my time. If there's only three or four things in the auction catalogue when I look online, I don't even bother turning it up. It's just not worth my time to go there and spend a day there and pull away 200 quid's worth of sales. You know, like I, I, I spend 50 quid and I'm going to make 200. There's no point. I might as well wait till the week after when there's more stuff there where I can spend 500 and get 2,000 quid's worth. You know, I, my time now is valuable in terms of the sourcing, and that's what I do, you know. So I'm very rare. Well, the only time I ever got a boot sales is only when me and Steve are going for a day out. I'm not even serious. We're just going around for a laugh. You know, that's not a big, you know, that's a day out for us. Do you still get a, a big buzz out of bidding at auction or is it much more just business no, business now? No, it's just business. See, uh, that's all gone. I don't get any excitement whatsoever. The only thing I get excited about is the uh, bacon and sausage barb that they do there because it's really nice. Uh, but apart from that, everything else, it's just, it's just a, a process, you know, it's just a process, but it's the most efficient process for me of getting these big job lots. And I've had some mega scores what about yourself, options. What about yourself, Sahir? Do you still get sucked into the excitement of bidding, or is it just for you now much more I, about I, the numbers? I think I'm kind of like a, a, a dog. I always get excited, no matter how, It's always new for me. Um, yeah. <laughs> no matter how many times I do it, I... I still, I mean, I still get excited by going to charity shops and boot fairs and you know whatever there is. I mean, there was actually a nice little question there, um, you know, or, or a comment by by someone that can't remember that said, "I where I stay, where I stay, there aren't many car boots, so I need charity shops." So not everyone's going to be in the same geographical location. So it, you, you know, it's good to have um, passion yeah, for for what you're doing. Again, with that though, is you know, I'll drive 50 miles to an auction. If the stock's there, do you know what I mean? I'd even drive a hundred. I've drove a hundred miles to an auction before now, because I knew there was stock there that was worth the money. So it just depends on your. I mean, obviously, if you've not got any transport, you're only doing it part time. Is I'm, I'm talking from a full time point of view now. You have to go where the where the stock is, you know, and you, yeah. uh, and you, uh, you have to buy it in bulk. I mean, I see your car boot hauls, Nick. And I mean, to say you've virtually like bought a stall's worth, really, haven't you? By the time you come out of there, you could you could set up your own stall with the amount of stock you've got in the back of that car. You know, you, you don't just buy two or three things, do you? You you go in big, don't you? Well, you have to. I mean, it, you're it, not going to make the money otherwise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
you have to buy a lot of stuff just to make the numbers make sense. And yeah, that's that's what I've always done. I, we have a little thing in our little chat, the whole go big or go home thing. And and once you step yeah. into the full time version of reselling, you, you have to switch a gear up really. Otherwise, it, the, it, the numbers don't make sense. And yeah. and it's a lot of graft and it's a lot of work. But yeah, you have to go big or go home. <laughs> I mean, Ke yeah. um, Nick. I mean, like, w what about yourself? I mean, that was an interesting question. I mean, do you still get a buzz when you find a a good find at a charity shop or a, or a boot sale? I mean, considering how many years you've been doing this now. Hell yeah! I I yeah. I, I feed off that. You know, that's you what gets it, me yeah. going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, I. I yeah. <coughs> it's Sorry, what I sets me out of bed at five or six in the morning. It it that want to go and find the stuff. I see it as a personal challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. It, I get, I get it's nice, isn't it? I get a buzz out of finding a nice item. Don't get me wrong, I love all that. But the actual auction process, I don't get into that sort of like hysteria, you know, where I'll have a, I'll have a limit and I'll stick to that limit or I may go slightly above I will cut off, uh, you know, you can always, I mean, like our auctions, it's like a bit cliquey, really. Uh, all the regulars are there every week, and uh, then a new guy comes along and he starts bidding like he's going out of fashion, you know, he's spending money like a drunken sailor, and everybody's switched on to it, you know, they say, oh, God, a newbie in the house, you know, <laughs> do you, and, it's, and it's one of them, do you, you know. Do you wait till he goes to the toilets and then all go in there and bundle him? Is that what happens? No, he, they usually run out of steam, and uh, uh, generally speaking, they don't last long because two or three weeks they've spent the money and they've overspent and they can't sell the items, and uh, you know it's just they, they disappear. Yeah, you know, the other quickly. thing about auctions, which again I want to get back into actually, but I haven't done for a long time, is some people don't realise how long you have to sit there. I've been to an auction. It's a like big endurance. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. you've got a hundred lots to wait until the next thing you're really interested in, and it's like, oh my god, it can it can be yeah, a really long, hard it's slog. It's a long day and it's tiring, but you've got to have that endurance. Uh, as as the, as the, as the sale goes on, the prices tend to go down. I find because yeah. people are all enthusiastic at the beginning, and people spend. And, you know, they spend a lot of money and the people start dwindling away. Well, they do at our auctions because you can actually take stock as you've bought it. So, you know, towards the end, there's half the people in the room that were in there at the beginning. But it is an endurance fest. You've got to stay there. But there's many a time that I go around uh, on the view and ticking all the different things off that I'm interested in. There's many a time that I buy six things that aren't even on my list because, you know, he starts off, he goes, I, I bought a load of Masonic stuff this week. I wasn't even looking at it. And he went, you know, he'll give me £30 for this, £30, £20. He went, tenner, surely. I just stuck my hand up, tenner. You know, and I got and I got the item for a tenner. Uh, I wasn't even really after it, but I knew there was value there. So sometimes sales will, things will crop up as they're going through the sale that you're not even really looking at. But just you just think, hang on a minute, nobody's interested in this. I'm going to dive on this. I mean, we've got 80 you know people I mean? watching, and I I think that an interesting point that you just there made there, Ken, is that even out of like the people watching, even if people aren't going to your headset's gone, Z. Oh, okay, hold on one second, one second. Okay. That, that took a it long time for your headset to break. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, I, I didn't use it so much. Um, okay, how's that? Is that better? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, what was interesting about what Ken you were talking about there is is really what you were talking about is hard work and again the whole go big or go home because those of us that go to boot fairs properly will spend hours and hours there as well. Um, it, you know, if you do a boot fair properly, it's not easy. It's it's physically demanding and it's time consuming um, for you to actually be there and to to to, to kind of do it properly. I mean, like when you mentioned Nick going there and being able to fill the boot of his car consistently, it's not because he just goes around, has one quick lap around, and that's his car full. That's, you know, it takes effort and time to do that. Um, yeah. Unless I'm, unless I'm misquoting you, um, yeah, Nick, at all. Is that is that true or not? I mean, or do, yeah, or do you well, find all that in one go and that's it? <laughs> Well, Andrew and I often joke when I when I come back, or if we've both gone, we'll get in and we'll say we've probably walked five or ten miles because yeah. like you say you don't just whiz around once; you'll go around a second time. And quite often, I'll do three or four boot sales in a morning, 
Yep. So then you've got to get to the next one and then you whiz around that and you get home and you're physically screwed <laughs> and we're not getting any younger. So yeah, it, it can be, but it keeps me fit. I, I honestly yeah. think that, that that is my weekend workout is, is legging it around the boot sale. But, but that effort translates into what you find and it's the same at the auctions. Uh, the people that don't have the that don't have the patience, that don't have the staying power, that don't have the resilience or the passion won't do as well as the people that do. Um, I mean, you know, if, for example, Ken mentioned that auctions can sometimes be a bit clicky with, with you know, little groups. You're not going to ever break into a click or start your own click if you're what, someone that gives up easily. Um, you, you know, you could either get intimidated by that and then not turn up after a couple of weeks. Or if you're took me, if you're it took me six months to keep going, won't you? Yeah, it took me six months to get accepted at this auctions where people actually started talking to me and saying what you're after and, you know, can we, I'll, I'll buy something, they'll say, well, do you want all of that? They, like now, I know people, like, I might only want three items in a lot or four items of the premium items, the rest of it's junk. But some guy will come up to me now and say, well, you don't want all that, do you? You know, and, and I'll sell it at the auction. I'll sell part of the lot at the auction. Uh, real, you know, the real crap. Uh, but it's took me months to get in, get get in with them. You know what I mean? Because when I first rocked up there last year, I was the newbie to them. They didn't know that I'd been buying at auctions for years. But to, to them, I was the newbie. You know, because they'd never seen me before. So suddenly, and I and I was paying up for stuff. But I knew what it was worth. But in their eyes, I was probably paying too much. So you know, it does take a while to get in there because. These auctions that you go to, it is the same people there every week. You'll recognise the same people there every week. So much so that when they're not there, you miss them. You know, you think, God, where's he gone? You know, what's he doing today? You know, and it's and it is like that. And the new buyers do stand out like a sore thumb. Um, but it is an endurance game. I mean, this week I was I got there at half eleven and got out at half four, which isn't bad. But again, that's five hours on your feet. You know, going through stuff and, and 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 standing about while other lots sell, and you know it is it does take it does take its toll on you. It does it is tiring, you know. And I've been to some that have been started at ten o'clock in the morning and finished at six o'clock at night. You know, eight hours of a job. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, you've got to have the staying power, but that's that's my main source now. So that to me, I think well, yeah. I've got to get everything in one day, and I don't need to go out for the rest of the week then, or two weeks sometimes, you know, yeah. till I've got it all listed. So it works. I was just going to say, um, so here, have we got any uh, last question? Maybe we should. Oh, that noise just came back. Yeah, no, I think that's telling us that we should call it. Cause it's, oh, where yeah, it's come where back. does that come from? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Is it from being too close, too far? I don't know. I've moved. Right. Okay, well, we, well, we, we ended up with over 80 people watching, so thank you everyone for for sticking with the technical gremlins. It was well <coughs> worth it just to hear Ken talk about, you know, how his his unique take on how he does things. Um, I hope everyone got something useful out of it, because you know, thanks Ken, because I really you know soaked in an awful lot of. I, 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 it's always nice to get a different perspective. Um, from how you do well, things. Say, the way I do it is not the perfect way. It's just my way. And, and I think that's one thing, as a final thing to say, that people do need to concentrate on is don't always do it how everyone else is doing it. Do it your own way. Whether it's the way you list, the way you source, the way you price, the way you photograph your items. Do it your way, the way you feel comfortable. And if it's not going right, adapt it. Don't always think that you have to be a carbon copy of somebody else to be successful. You're better off doing it your own way. I mean, three sellers here, and we all operate completely differently. You know, and we're all... I mean, me and Zaheer are still building up. We're not We're not the finished article by a long, long way uh, where we want to be. Nick probably is a lot further along than we are because he's been but doing Ken, it for a lot longer. Can I just say, that's, that's interesting yeah. as well because we could both say we were both inspired by Nick in the way as well. Yeah, um, so, yeah. so even though we were both inspired by Nick, we're all three very different with how we operate our reselling, yeah, and we're different. all doing it to some level of, you know, decency, reasonable, reasonable success. For, yeah. for but the thing is, again, we're only two years in, 
And you look at most businesses, they don't make a penny for two years, three years, four years. You open a restaurant and see how long it is before you start making a profit. Or even if you survive that first 12 months. It's hard. And the thing is, is there's not just one way of doing it. There's multiple ways. But I see a lot of people, all they want to do is just basically copy what somebody else is doing. But not just copy it, but copy it to the letter. Buy the exact same thing at the exact same price and sell it. You know... Just go your own way, folks, and, yeah. and, 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 and prepare to fail on a few things. It's no big deal if you fail, is it? You just do something else. Absolutely. Just try something else. All, you know? I've ever, all I've ever done is made it up as I go along and keep changing <laughs> it until it works. That's that's kind, yeah. kind of become my mantra, just just make it up. But, yeah, I would have to agree 100% with the other guys. That, um, just chart your own course with this. Take inspiration from, from these other guys, myself, whoever. But then once you've got that inspiration to have a go, do it your own way, chart your own course. And I think, guys, we're going to have to leave it there because I need to go and get ready to go out. So yeah, no worries. <laughs> I, I just want to thank uh, Zaheer as ever for, for chatting with me and our special guest, Ken. It was fantastic chatting with you again. And the currently 77 people who have made it to the end, <laughs> I appreciate sticking with us because we've been fraught with technical issues and I might have to edit this one before it goes up on my channel. <laughs> but yeah, thanks a lot guys and we'll speak again soon. Okay. Yeah. Cheers. See you later. Cheers guys.